Hello, my name is Derek de Kirkhove, and I am a professor of anthropology at the Polytechnic Institute of Milano. And this is why I feel that talking about the digital twin is a relevant issue in this series about identity, about digital identity. The personal digital twin was invented, at least the, the name was invented in 2002 by an engineer called Michael Greaves, who had this idea that because industry and manufacturing had created a great quantity of digital reproduction of machines, uh, turbines, complex motors, uh, in building them, he thought, why not use them also to monitor them? Monitoring meaning following the various stages of development of the technology, the way it was functioning, the problem it might encounter. To have a digital twin of a machine would be very interesting and useful because you would, you would be able to correct digitally things that did not work in the actual machine. This was actually uh, used, this idea was used, for a, the exploration of the moon in the first landing on the moon, where there was on Earth a digital twin of the uh, spatial, uh, the, 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 the spaceship that arrived on the moon. So that anything that would happen was seen immediately. And if anything wrong was happening, it could be at least corrected by sending the right message at the right time through this simulation machine. So the idea of the digital twin was uh, born and used in those early days. And since it has been developed in many different directions, and it has a, a attracted the attention not only of engineers, <coughs> of doctors, uh, even of lawyers, uh, but also of professors like myself. And so I wrote a book about this with uh, Professor Roberto Saracco, uh, which is being published right now. So we've been looking at all the details of the digital twin. You have to understand that the first application of the idea of the digital twin was in manufacturing. And of course, that's where it was immediately developed and very fast developed. But another area where it was important was medical. The medical services uh, already have a lot of information about us, us individually. And so it was very important to have a simulation of a digital twin of our medical condition. And so that was a very strong push towards what became the personal digital twin. And I will be emphasizing more the personal digi digital twin because it is that which is the closest to the issue of digital identity. Um, the first step towards the personal digital twin is what was called and is still called the cognitive digital twin. Now, imagine that you are on a shop floor and you are in a manufacturing context and you have to run several operations at once and you have different machines and they're all automated and they have robots doing this and that and you need to have an or a coordination of all, these, of all these functions. So that is where the cognitive digital twin, which overlooks all the operations on the shop floor becomes a very strong uh, help to the pr process and acceleration and quali quality uh, survey or corrections of, of, the, of the various operations and, and the final product. So the cognitive digital twin is the step by which the digital twin moves from a mechanical representation of the, of the tool into a psychological representation of the tool. We're not quite there yet with the personal digital twin, which I will be explaining, of course, as, as soon as we get there. Now, you might ask, what are the drivers? How, what could possibly create such a situation? Well, the first driver was the fact that you could use the computer-assisted design 
of the of, of the whatever object you were creating as a monitoring device. That was the start. But the other thing is that digital twins require enormous quantities of data. And more complex is the twin, more data you need. So we had to wait for this data to be available. And we call it big data. So that's one of the second big driver. Computing power. Computing power doubles every 18 months, as we know, by Moore's law. Computing power was required also. Very strong computing power was required to collect all these data, classify them, put them together in such a way that it would make sense. So big data, uh, strong computing power, uh, the drive of the industry. These were all main drivers, but there was another one. And that other one is the digital assistant. Do you use Siri or Alexa or Bixby? The digital assistant was born in 1987 in a little video done by John Scully, who was the head of Apple computers at the time, which predicted everything we are using now. It was an amazing video, and I hope you, you will be able to uh, see it for yourself, because not only does it have a digital assistant who is a friendly looking character with a little bow tie, uh, who answers questions by the user, who is a professor of geology, I think. Uh, but it also is totally interactive. It has a, access to a huge search engine. It uh, actually gives you video on demand. There's all kinds of extraordinary prediction in that little video. So the digital twin idea, while formalized by an engineer, Michael Greaves, uh, became actually a cultural a cultural per, a person, so to speak, uh, thanks to this fantastic little little video. So these are the these are the things that you need to know about about uh, the digital twins' origin. Now, where is a digital twin being developed? Pretty well everywhere in the world, but mostly in the Western world. And that comes from a very interesting question about identity. The Western world is based literally on having a strong personal individual identity. That is, doesn't mean that the Eastern world doesn't, but one of the reasons why there is such differences today between East and West is because I, personal private identity is key in the, in the West, whereas community identity is key in the East. And that comes from, as, from their language and from their writing systems and from their their general history, uh, and you can trace this very keenly. But to give you a simple example of that, which I think is worth knowing, whereas the West has developed the digital twin, the East has developed what's called social credits, which means that the digital transformation, that is everything that is happening in the world today because of digital media, the digital transformation speaks a different language to both East and West. It speaks a dominant self, personal identity in the, in the West, and the community orientation, the need for community to respect the rules and play by the, by, by the rules. This is absolutely fundamental. So I, the book that I have finished with uh, uh, Dr. Saraco has been uh, about that, about how, and it's des it is actually destined to Chinese readers. It's being pub translated and published right now. It has been translated, it's being published right now. And it is about that. It's what, the, what the main thing of the East being the digital twin and the main thing of the West, or rather the West being the digital twin and the main thing of the East being social credits and community orientation. So it's important. Now, another thing is, What's the role of Europe in this? Well, Europe likes a digital twin. And there has been a lot of talk about digitizing, not only making twins of cities, and you can. There are cities who have digital twins. Singapore is an example. Interesting, because Singapore is both east and west together, very much so. But Singapore has a digital twin city. Uh, Helsinki is working on digital twin city. Um, num, 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 uh, Riga is uh, working on it. So there are several parts of the world which are working on digital cities. But what's interesting is that the, the European Digital Commission is thinking about the world in digital form. In other words, you take the whole world and all the data around uh, twinning and you put it all together. 
And so it's quite an extraordinary thing to have all of these things uh, happening. So what's, what is the story towards the personal digital twin? We, it's not really there yet. It's in the mind of many people. It is being developed and so on. And, but it is basically using all the data first of medical uh, research and your private documents about what you know your story, your medical history, and so on, which is where all of it is actually happening. It's a very powerful uh, way of getting into into digital twins. But um, one thing that one you need to know is that uh, your digital twin is in your cell phone. It's already in your cellular phone. Right here, <clears throat> you have all the information in various categories about your health, about your financial transactions, about your interests and tastes, about your communication with other people. The information is there. It hasn't been put together yet. What we need is somebody who is capable of taking all of this information and use it in such ways that you can actually create your own personal digital twin from your, your, your cell phone. So the problem is you have the categories already in the cell phones. You have to harmonize them and put them together in a particular way. Now the question is, do we want a digital twin which is one together, or do we want digital twins for each part of our lives? Do we want to put together all the information in our cell phone, or do we want to have that in a um, in, in, in different categories so that when you need to know more about your health, you have all that information. When you need to know more about your, per, your financial transactions, you have all that information. And all of these things come together when you need them or come one by one in other ways. There is good arguments to have a personal digital twin representation. Why? Because a personal digital twin can actually put all these together to come up with decisions about what you want or what you need to know. Uh, your cell phone has a better memory than you do. And so that the idea of connecting with your cell phone, all the stuff that you want, yes, you can have it bit by bit. But when it comes to ask opinions to your digital twin, when it comes to make judgments, today, what do we do with judgment? Today, we actually ask Siri or Alexa to make a decision for us. And we have machines that actually <laughs> help us doing that in our loudspeakers and things like that. So, you know, this is the kind of the, of the new way of doing things. Um, that advice comes from outside. That advice on what music you should listen to, which person should you connect with, and all of that comes from outside and usually serves the interest of the provider, which is Amazon or which will be uh, uh, Apple or whatever. The point is the personal digital twin is your information and it is your interest, and it is who you are. And so the idea of having a unified personal digital twin is actually very useful. And so that's why we're thinking both direction, the division of labor between various aspects of our personality and the collective uh, labor of, uh, or the collective information that we could, could be really a good advice. An example. Uh, you go on Tinder, yeah, you, you go on Tinder, and you find different people and so on, and you get very, very close to one or another person. How about asking your personal digital twin, who is the better person that you have actually been involved with on Tinder or in your life? Because, of course, your digital twin has access not only to your data, but to whatever is happening in the world, because all it takes is having a digital analytics system that actually gets that information and that provides it and collaborate and, and co uh, collect it in, in terms of your own information to know better what, uh, who you should marry or who you should decide to uh, spend time with. What kind of job do you want to take? You're an 18 year old, you're at the university and you want to, you really don't know whether you should become a designer or a, an engineer or you should be an artist or you should write, you know. Wouldn't your digital twin, knowing you since the 18 years that uh, you know, your information about you has been gathered either on your phone or in data banks, because even as a baby, you're immediately identified, your private identity. It's actually clear, clear that at that point, 
it becomes extremely useful to have somebody who can give very, very substantial advice and support to whatever it is that you want to do. So this is something which I think is really an, a, a key uh, development that we are seeing along with the other developments that, uh, that happen in the world. The, the, the fact is that if I say, for example, that uh, everything that is known about you is right there in your cell phone, um, that's one thing, that's one way of looking at it, and it is useful, and of course, it's going to be used to help you. But there is a new thing developing alongside with work on digital twins, which we all know is chat GPT. Okay, chat GPT, is, the, is one of the major steps of a long development that uh, OpenAI, a company that developed these things, uh, has created. What does GPT mean? Gener uh, generative pre-training transformer. These are the key words to understand what that is. And what that is, the generative is what allows to create a language that you can read or even images that you can create from a few words. There are other programs uh, that do that. But the basic GPT is that it has access to so many data available online. Uh, and these are called parameters. That is, when you ask a question such as, should, which job should I, which direction should my studies take and which job should I have? then you can actually uh, get information from parameters. That is everything that is about you. And that can be in great, great quantity or small. That you know, all depends on how much is known about you. But that is called parameters. Well, let me just uh, give you an example. The, the first GPT was 175 million parameters. Not bad. And it was really an extraordinary thing already to be able to put together 175 million things that could be known about you that would actually give us a really good answer. The second generation, GPT-3, was, uh, GPT was 175 billion parameters. That's a huge jump from millions to billions. That means that the actual precision of the answers given to you about what question you had asked was forever bigger. Today, people are talking about trillions. And there is competition between China and, uh, and the US on that too. The, the moment uh, <laughs> chat GPT, or not chat, but the moment GPT 1, 2, or 3 comes up, there is Wu Dao from China, 1, 2, and 3. So there's a real tension. But that's great. That competition is fantastic. And the, the system can speak Chinese or can speak English or Italian or Brazilian. There's no problem at all. It's simply you know, as our translation system. Now, the thing that's really key and that's really important regarding the personal digital twin is the fact that recently, and this is something that Dr. Saracco has been ex exploring recently, uh, not only does ChatGPT or GPT-4 or BARD, which is the uh, Google's chat GPT. Not only that those various systems have access to the 175 billions or trillions <laughs> parameter that are available online somewhere, anywhere. They have access to your cell phone. They have access to your information about you. They have access to everything that you thought was private and personal. It's actually now accessible also. So you put together 175 billion parameters about whatever your question concerns. And then you add all the parameters that actually are defining who and how you are. And you have an entirely different proposition. It's not there yet. Nothing of this is there yet. But all of this is clearly appearing on the horizon of the future of the personal digital twin.